Um, so our speaker for tonight's community lecture series is Mr. Douglas Vescoviak, and um, I have prepared text, so I'm sorry about that, but I'll read a little bit. Uh, Douglas explores the democratizing influences of GIS to inform, educate, engage, and empower the public and community decision making. He has worked with communities and citizens across Wisconsin applying GIS methodologies for innovative decision making, public participation, plan development, assessment, implementation, and monitoring. In addition to community and natural resources planning, Douglas is exploring the utility of GIS for emergency management, investigating human health land use relationships, and conducting business assessments. So, without any further ado, I'm going to let Douglas explain all that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dean Yonke, for the introduction, and thank you all for attending tonight. I know I've got a little bit of competition. I guess I'm competing with uh, the president and the State of the Union address. <laughs> Good thing it's not the Packers, because I don't think I'd win on that one. Again, my name is Doug Muscoviak. I've been in landscape architecture and urban and regional planning, and now the Department of Geography, so place-based professions for now well over 20 years. I think I started in landscape architecture in 1995, and in my master's work, worked with urban and regional planning. But in both regards, I used a technology called geographic information systems. I'm gonna talk about that technology a little bit later, but it's really a computer-based technology that focuses on maps, focuses on place, focuses on geography. So if you take a look at the title for tonight's presentation, preserving the legacy of place, we're gonna focus a lot about geography. And geography is both physical and cultural. It's natural. It takes those natural characteristics, but it's also really about what humans value about those landscapes. And it's also a story about how humans champion those causes to take what they value about these places and then utilize these technologies that I'm gonna talk about again later, geographic information systems, as a way to learn about what makes these places special. And more than that, more than just learning about what these places are that make them special, then communicating what makes them special to us, to other human beings, to champion the cause to protect Wisconsin's or other great places. And I'm gonna begin the presentation with the word legacy. It's something that my professor thought quite a bit about in 2001, right when he retired. I was his last grad student, and I had the benefit of working on some amazing projects for him. If you take a look at the definition, something transmitted by or received from an ancestor or predecessor or from the past, that something could be a place. It doesn't have to be a place. It could be a trinket. It could be your grandmother's ring. I remember having a drink with a friend, and he was talking about the legacy he was creating for his family. He was building a cabin on a lake, and he was putting it in a family trust so that his grandchildren and their grandchildren could enjoy that place together. Place can have very positive connotations associated with them, just like his story or your grandmother's ring. But Legacy can also have a negative connotation to it. And you can think of things like the opioid epidemic, the legacy of drug abuse here in Wisconsin. That's a place-based phenomenon that's occurring right here that has legacy associated with it, one that's not very kind. Tonight's story, I'm gonna talk about legacy associated with two places in Wisconsin, one called Moose Lake and the other called Lake Le Coudre. And again, I'll talk about how I use geographic information systems to describe those places. But before I get there, I want to talk a little bit more about what I do as a geographer, as a landscape architect, as an urban and regional planner, and talk a little bit more about what that science of geography is. Geography is one of the world's oldest sciences. It's one of those developed by the early Greeks. Geo is a root that means earth. So geography is a science that deals with events, objects, phenomena that exist at or near Earth's surface. So many talk about geography as the science of where, much as when you talk about history, they think of it as a humanity of when something occurs. But 
in the profession, you learn that geography, landscape architecture, urban and regional planning are more about just where things exist on the landscape. It's way more than just that question, where is it? It's the how and the why location is significant. So it's much more profound than just geographic location. And you can think about maps. This is a glacial map of a county south of here. This is Dane County, Wisconsin. If you take a look at the center of the map, that's where Madison is located. 18,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago, roughly in that time frame, that's when the glacier stopped right along that dark green line. That's the end glacial moraine, the end moraine in Dane County, Wisconsin. And we can see all types of other glacial features left on that landscape, the Driftless area, we see where it's located, we see a lacustrine plain, we see other types of features. But why is that significant? Why does it matter? Turns out that Glacier dug out those soils from Canada and northern Wisconsin and deposited east of that line. So if you look at those dark green areas or those lighter green areas, that's where those soils were dropped off. Turns out Dane County, because of that, is these deep, rich prairie soils that are great for growing row crops. Dane County, as a result of that glacier being there at that location, it's one of the most agriculturally productive counties in the entire nation as a result. We see another pattern emerge right in the center of those two lakes, Monona and Mendota. Planners like John Nolan and John Olin took a look at those features, saw unique geographic characteristics that people valued, the people that were moving there, they decided to locate a city there, the city that became known as Madison. So geography is much more than where, but the why and how where matters. And that takes us to other terminology that we use in the profession like space and place. If you take a look again in the dictionary, space and place have various definitions. A space is the space between two words. It's the space you're picking up here in this room. You can think about space in multiple different ways. It's a region that exists outside of Earth's atmosphere. It's not how we use the term as geographers, as landscape architects. You think about place, place can be a physical environment. It can be a building just like that one, but that's really not how I use the term in the profession. Quite frankly, in geography, space to us is a way to measure our environments, where they're located. The early Greeks invented latitude and longitude on a sphere, and then they learned how to bend, stretch, and warp that sphere onto an X, Y, and Z plane so that we can make measurements on flat maps. So when you think about space, we think about measuring geographic space on an X, Y, and Z coordinate plane. Now, place can also have that type of connotation. Place might be the coming together in geographic space at a specific point in space. That's one way to think about it. But all of you know that place is also imbued with human value. You think about the natural and physical world. Think about Stevens Point. You think about Madison. You think about all these great places. It could be France. What is it that makes them special? What makes them different? And of course, there's natural and physical characteristics that do that. But it's not just that. It's the human story that gets attached to these places. It's when people bring what they value about a landscape, what they value about living in a place, what they value about playing in a place, what they value about working in a place. All those stories also get imbued in that geographic location. And it takes time to really think, to really characterize what it is about a place that is special. Now, what is special about Stevens Point to you? Why do you live, work, and play here versus somewhere else? Out of any place in the world to live, work, or play, why do you choose this location? Your family was here. They created a story. They left you a legacy. They may have came from Europe. They might have came from other places, taking legacies with them and depositing these stories here at this place. It stirs emotion. You can think about the emotion that was stirred in John Muir. John Muir, the naturalist, is a boy that grew up in Wisconsin, not too far from Stevens Point, Wisconsin, just south of here. 
He left the central Wisconsin region for the University of Wisconsin, learned what he could there, and then left the university for what he called the University of the Wilderness, and then learned about places like the Sierra Nevada, like Yosemite, like Niagara Falls. And he understood how those places stirred an emotion inside of him that he couldn't quite explain, except maybe in poetry and narrative and storytelling. We now know there's some science between the ion exchange of these great places, taking a walk in the forest, you get reinvigorated by those places. So we can understand now that there's some science attached to what John Muir was feeling. But he also saw how other places, like Niagara Falls, were being commodified and commercialized. So he and others like Frederick Law Olmsted, who's the father of landscape architecture, created Central Park in New York City, thought about how to democratize landscapes so that everyone had a chance to see the natural and physical greatness of these places so that they could build their own legacies and own stories based in these great public places. So they thought and sought to protect them. We can also think about what role cyberspace has on our interaction in natural spaces. There was an article just a month ago out of Colorado. Our young people, 10 years later, are spending 50% less time out in nature, out playing outside. And what impact does that have on their ability to be appreciative of the natural landscape, like John Muir was, like many of us are? Distinctive, place is distinctive. Now this may have been changing as America has become a more mobile society. Our stories are no longer tied to a single place, but our stories are now distributed over multiple places. But you can think about how Stevens Point is like no other place on earth. You can think about how Stevens Point is like some other places, but like not other places. You can think about how Stevens Point is like all other places. And if that story of distinctiveness starts to disappear, why would we want to go anywhere but where we are? Why would we want to visit other places if they're like anything else? So figuring out what's distinctive about them matters. And we can think about those characteristics, those adjectives that define the Northwoods, which I'm about to talk about. So I'm going to call on you guys. You guys know what I'm talking about when I use the term Northwoods. What are the adjectives that define that place to you? Beautiful, green. green, pardon me, quiet, quiet. Great. Wild. wild, rustic, clean, I think someone already used beautiful. Then you think about, well, why do you go there? Why do you visit the North Woods? What is it that makes you visit that place instead of some other place like Madison, Wisconsin? It's remote. Family. Families there. Rejuvenate. To rejuvenate. Yeah, you've used some of the very same terms that I would have used. And I remember going to Manaqua and Boulder Junction with my father when I was a kid, and now taking my own son there, the characteristic is changing. It's much more developed than it's ever been. Of course, they've tore down Gilson's where we used to get minnows for 99 cents, which was in a... <laughs> Right? Minnows no longer cost 99 cents, at least not for 12 dozen. <laughs> but if Manaqua becomes as similar to the lakes in Indiana or the lakes in Michigan, why would we go there versus any of those other places? If we can't figure out what makes it distinctive, why does it even matter? So now I'm going to talk about using the technology, geographic information systems on two stories, one in Moose Lake in Sawyer County, Wisconsin, and the other on Lake Le Couture, just to the watershed to the west of Moose Lake, to talk about how we use the technology to figure out what it was about those places that were special. So again, geographic information systems is the technology that I deal with, and many people think of it as a mapping technology, and indeed it is. It's a set of technologies that are computer-based, digital 
that do exactly what a map used to do. Before the 1980s, of course, the map was our database management system. The map was the way we stored information about places. Now we use a computer to do that. Of course, the map, if you take a look at past landscape architects, like Elliot, Frederick Law Olmsted, they used maps and overlaid them together in geographic space to plan our new nation, using maps from the new United States Geologic Survey. Of course, we now use geographic information systems to overlay maps together to do that analysis much more quickly. So we can figure out through analysis what makes these places special, what makes them different, what makes them similar. But it's more than that. Maps are part of graphicacy, and graphicacy is one of humans' oldest ways of communicating with other humans. And it turns out to be a very effective one. If place stirs emotion, quite frankly, so does the map. The map has way more potential to stir emotion. That picture of place, where we live, work, and play, tends to stir emotion like no other form of communication. So maps become a vehicle, GIS becomes a vehicle for sharing information to take something that I care about and now construct and compile and craft a story that I'm going to share with you to champion a cause. And that's what the folks on Moose Lake did. That's what the folks on Lake Lacoudre did. They compiled a story to get other people to care about their place so that they could work to protect them. Moose Lake is located, and I, I don't have a buzzer, but in the center of this map, a laser, Moose Lake is located in one of Wisconsin's legacy landscapes, the Shawamigan National Forest. It's in the West Fork of the Chippewa River. If you take a look at the context map, Portage County is right in the middle. So we're taking a look at the Wisconsin Northwoods, deep within the Wisconsin Northwoods. And you can see Moose Lake is largely surrounded by public land with a, a few inholdings of lands that are developed. So really wonderful, natural, physical space. But the folks that live there started to ask questions about their environment. The environment on Moose Lake, even though it's in this natural characteristic, was changing, and they wanted to understand why. So they asked questions like this, and, and many more. Why are birch trees dying? Was it due to a pest? Was it due to disease? What was it? Moose Lake is a reservoir water body. There's a dam on it, and each year they draw down the water, and then they bring it back up in the spring, and they want to know if it had any impact on the ecology. They want to address that question. Because it's a reservoir, it has islands. They want to know if those islands were significant in any sort of way. And then they had other questions about how the resource was being managed. And the last one, who owns the resources? So it turns out they went to the experts that manage land, the Land Conservation Office, that deals with geographic information systems. And they asked them, well, how many islands are on Moose Lake? To which they replied, 10. Now, they started to scratch their heads. And they're like, you know, we've lived here a long time. And we know there's way more than 10. And they're like, yeah, we know. We probably know there's way more than 10. But we could care less because we don't tax those landscapes. So they went to the DNR and asked the DNR, and the DNR said, well, there's 60 islands on Moose Lake. So if you don't know if they exist on a map, how do you manage those resources? If you don't know who owns them, how do you manage them effectively? And the answer is you can't. Not in a democratic society that's based on public and private land values, if, you, if that matters to anybody. So they sought out to map it themselves. It wasn't 10. It wasn't 60. It was 82. The citizens mapped it themselves. They spent an entire summer with a small grant to hire me to help them use this technology to map the things that made this place special, including who owned it. They mapped the aquatic plants, the plants that were on the lake. They mapped the trees that were around it. They mapped the critters that they were seeing. They mapped if they could see a house or if it was in a complete natural condition, among several other factors. And here's one of those inventories in which we took Stephen Spickerman from the US Forest Service. And he's speaking with one of our citizens here as they're doing the mapping, helping them learn about what makes this place special. So the question, why are the birch trees dying? 
Now, we all have our hypotheses. Again, it could be a pest, it could have been disease, it could have been some disaster like a windfall or a tornado. It wasn't any of them. So what happened in northern Wisconsin in the late 1800s, early 1900s? <coughs> the cutover. And what are the first species to emerge after a cutover? Aspen and white birch. And white birch, if you're a forester, if you know anything about that tree specimen, they live to about 80 to 100 years old. So if you take a look at the maps that the citizens collected, of course, they were seeing white birch and they were seeing them die, but they were being replaced by white pine, sugar maple, yellow birch, and hemlock. And if you look at this map, which was compiled by the Wisconsin surveyors between 1833 to 1866, those were the same species that they were seeing back then. So it's not a story of disaster. It's a wonderful story of natural succession. This landscape has healed dramatically from 100 years ago, and the climax species are reemerging. Moreover, there was a landscape, and again, I don't have a laser here, but there was a landscape that they saw that may have never changed from when the glacier went through, of black spruce and white cedar. And you can see that on Moose Lake over here. It likely never changed from that condition. It's probably always too hard to log. So it was a really wonderful story, and we mapped that. What's the impact of the lake drawdown? So we started to talk to aquatic biologists like Laura Herman. She started to show us the impact of different types of plants. And she told us this lake drawdown impacts the ability for the perennial aquatic macrophytes like rushes and reeds to grow in time for the perch to affix their eggs. Now this is a self-sustaining walleye and muskie fishery. And if the perch do not have the ability to lay their eggs in a self-sustaining way, because those other plants aren't available, the other fish up the food chain go away. Fortunately, Moose Lake also has a annual plant called wild rice, manumen. And now the perch affix their eggs to that annual plant. So we've learned a little bit more about that related to the geography. And we mapped where the wild rice were. Unfortunately, this landscape is now being invaded by cattails. Now, cattails, of course, are native to Wisconsin, but 50 to 100 years ago, they were never in the Wisconsin Northwoods. So they're moving north. And the impact of that is they're competing for those same shallow areas as the wild rice. And we map those areas of competition. Now, of course, these maps are slightly too small for you to see, but we showed displayed where those two critters existed together, wild rice competing for the same areas. And now that I've returned a decade later, we can see those cattail patches are getting much bigger. And those patches are so thick that there's no way they're useful for fish breeding habitat. How significant are the islands? What we found is that white cedar, if you took a look at the white cedar on the islands, and according to Steven Spickerman, our US Forest Service biologist, it had the healthiest populations of white cedar anywhere in the seven to 800,000 acres of Shawamigan Forest. Now, if you know a little bit about white-tailed deer, you know that they love white cedar. In the wintertime, they will browse it, and if you take a look at the white cedar that exists on the mainland, that top photo, you can see it's browsed to as far as a white-tailed deer can reach, but on the islands, you can see they're not browsed at all. Now, of course, Wisconsin lakes still freeze. And when they're snow covered, deer can walk across that snow to get to these white cedar. Why do they no longer do that? What emerged on its own 30 years ago, maybe 35 years ago, came in from Canada and Minnesota and came back to Wisconsin that the that white-tailed deer are afraid of, the wolf. The wolf returned to this landscape. And white-tailed deer have now learned that they're very vulnerable to cross the ice to get to the. So these islands are now acting as a refuge for species that wouldn't exist in the Schwamigan forest otherwise without the ecology of the wolf. Now I've got a colleague, Dr. Eric Larson. This is him in this photo. 
has done similar research out in Yellowstone. Now that the wolf has returned to Yellowstone, the aspen are starting to regenerate. Because the aspen are regenerating, there's other critters like the beaver returning. Because these other critters are returning to the landscape, the Yellowstone River is returning to a much more natural condition, a much more natural flow. We see the same thing in northern Wisconsin, just in a different way. So the ecology of the wolf is a hypothesis about why that is returning in such a way. So we learned about that significance and that legacy. The loon, of course, a beautiful critter, beautiful sound. I think all of you have heard of loon. Turns out that they inhabit the smallest islands on Moose Lake. And if you know the biology of a loon, you understand that their legs are positioned far to the back of their bodies, which makes them really elegant swimmers, graceful swimmers, especially underwater. But they're really awkward on land. So they choose the smallest islands purposefully to escape or avoid predation altogether. Now, if this is a reservoir landscape and they mismanage the depth of that water, they could be mismanaging the legacy of the loon on Moose Lake. It matters. The smallest islands matter on this water body. And again, those were the islands that Sawyer County could care less about. If you don't map them, how do you know they exist? How do you manage for that? So here's all the critters that we were mapping that year. So the land and its resources cannot be effectively managed unless ownership can be discerned. So we did that too. We went back to the old paper records, some of which existed all the way back to Abraham Lincoln's time. The old paper records, 1800s. Wisconsin managed their own land records since 1848 and did it the same way until about the 1990s. <laughs> and they went back and they reminded XL Energy that they owned these islands. XL Energy didn't remember it. They weren't managing it, but there were invasive species present there. There was wild rice present there. If you take a look at the upper corner of those green islands, those were managed by the US Forest Service. It wasn't on any of their land records. They didn't remember it. So we help them recall what they own. This is a reservoir water body, so somebody owns the land underneath this water. It's unlike a natural lake. For reservoirs, someone owns the land underneath it. Somebody owns those islands. And those old land records show that. So we documented that as well. Again, 82 islands, not 10, not 60, but 82. And then the citizens took it upon themselves to overlay all this data that they were collecting to figure out what makes Moose Lake special. And then they prioritized it. Let's identify those shorelines that have many intrinsic qualities that, that we want to protect, identify the greatest potential. Those that are mapped in blue and green are those that have the greatest ecological value according to these group of citizens. And they worked with a land trust to try to protect them in perpetuity. Which takes us to the next story, Lake Le Coudre. Again, it's the watershed to the west. It's the Upper Coudre River watershed. It's a 125 square mile watershed, and it consists of five cranberry bogs, 8,000 acres of agriculture, the most agricultural watershed in this particular county. 8,000 acres isn't a lot for a county, but this is the most for Sawyer County. 4,600 acres of development, and 30,000 acres of forest. What's significant about this watershed is that 8 billion gallons of water fall in precipitation annually in this watershed. And out of that 8 billion gallons, almost every drop will eventually flow into Lake Le Coudre in the center of that map before it flows out of Lake Le Coudre into the Billy Boy flowage before it flows into the Chippewa River and eventually out to the Gulf of Mexico. But guess what gets picked up along the way? Any sediment, any pollutant, phosphorus, and nitrogen. And that's the problem with the legacy of Lake Le Coudre. The folks on Lake Le Coudre are not in control of their own destiny. Even if they limited all phosphorus contributions to the lake, they would still get phosphorus contributions from the agriculture, from the cranberry bogs, from other land uses, all getting deposited into Lake Le Couture. What's special 
about Lake Le Coudre, their legacy is a two-story fishery. There's not many of these in Wisconsin. I'll talk about that in a moment. It's got two stories. The warm Eplimnian story freely exchanges oxygen with the atmosphere because of its relationship to the atmosphere. It's right next to it. So the water may be warm, but it's well oxygenated. So warm water fishes love it, like muskie and walleye and bass, perch. They all inhabit that upper story. What makes Lake Le Couture special is that first story, the Metalimnion, also called the thermocline, which is where the temper temperature gradient falls the fastest. It has enough dissolved oxygen to support those fish, but it's also cold enough to support those fish, those fish being whitefish here, really wonderful eating fish, and then Cisco, which is also known as a lake or freshwater herring. It's really about this size, really slender bodied, soft fins, and really fatty tissue. We'll talk about that significance in a little bit. There is no third story or basement story where lake trout would reside. But it's an extremely rare type of fishery. Wisconsin has 15,089 lakes, and a little over 7,000 of those lakes have fisheries. 200 are considered two-story fisheries, but only 100 of them are self-sustaining, where the DNR does not have to stock them on a regular basis. There's only five, and one of them is Lake Le Couture, that supports both cisco and whitefish at the same time and is considered an outstanding resource water. Moreover, the habitat is exceptionally fragile and small. Only 5% of this really giant lake is capable of supporting that cisco, and only a quarter percent of that volume is capable of supporting whitefish. And there's two factors threatening both of those. In fact, in 2016, there was a massive die-off. So climate change is one of those factors affecting this legacy. September no longer acts as an autumn month in the Northwoods. It acts just like it does with August. So the waters don't get a chance to cool in time for these fish to escape the oxygen-depleted waters to get up to the story that freely exchanges gases with the atmosphere. The other problem is all that excessive nutrification, all those soils and sediments coming to Lake Le Couture. Unfortunately, there's filamentous algae and there's aquatic invasive species. And it creates excessive plant growth in those summer months. And as those plants die and decay, the process of decay consumes dissolved oxygen. And it consumes it out of that second story so they either, the cisco or the whitefish, either suffocate or they try to escape to those warmer waters and then they die either way. If you don't care about those critters, you might care about these. Another part of the legacy story on Lake Le Couture, the world's largest muskies have been caught on Lake Le Couture largely to the fact that there's cisco present there. 1949, Cal Johnson caught the world record muskie, which stands today at 69 pounds and eight ounces. Likely, larger muskies have been caught, but either outside of the season or they have not been officially weighed. So lucky for Cal. <laughs> if you want to visit that legacy muskie, it's still on display at the Moccasin Bar in Hayward, Wisconsin. It's pretty cool to see. The kids love to look at it. But that's part of that legacy. And it is at risk due to this nutrient. Now, phosphorus is a nutrient that is tightly bound to soils. So as it travels with water across the landscape and enters a water system, it gets carried along and then creates a bank of phosphorus that exists. So if you think about agriculture in this watershed, if you think about cranberry bogs in this watershed, they have a 70 to 80 year history. So there's 70 to 80 year bank of phosphorus and soils that have been deposited to Lake Le Couture. And that phosphorus is always being emitted from those soils, creating a constant source for plant growth. Of course, phosphorus is a necessary nutrient on land, but even a tiny bit of phosphorus in water can create a problem of excessive plant growth. So that takes us to phosphorus in the Clean Water Act. 
Because Lake Le Couture is a two-story fishery in the 1960s, there's a standard created 15 parts phosphorus to every billion parts of water. That's the upper limit. But if you take a look at the watershed, if you take a look at Sisabagama, you take a look at whitefish, you take a look at several of those other red water bodies, they already suffer in that regard. They are impaired waters according to the Clean Water Act. And a few years ago, Lake Le Couture was suffering the same problem and they asked the DNR to list it in 2012. Instead of listing it, the DNR decided to take Musky Bay, and if you see Musky Bay, again, I wish I had a pointer, but it's that small bay on the bottom side of Lake Le Couture. Instead of 15 parts per billion, Musky Bay, where the musky end up laying their eggs, has 40 to 50 parts per billion phosphorus. And on a two-story fishery, the DNR would have to take a watershed action approach to keep phosphorus from emerging. Instead, the DNR decided to separate Musky Bay from Lake Le Couture. They now call it its own water body. It's a water body onto itself. So they've listed that as an impaired water so they didn't have to take action, at least from a phosphorus standpoint. A few years later, they eventually did list Lake Le Couture, but for dissolved oxygen, not for phosphorus as a problem. Again, so they wouldn't have to take a watershed approach, which might affect the agriculture, which might affect the cranberry bogs. So this group, the Couture Lakes Association, has taken it upon themselves for decades to protect the legacy on Lake Le Couture. Their overall goal is to change the Clean Water Act to 10 parts per billion, 10 parts phosphorus to a billion parts water. And they've been working with the cranberry growers to eliminate discharges. They've investigated technical fixes like dredging out the phosphorus or placing aluminum to bind the phosphorus to the bottom of the lake. They've decided not to do either one of those. Instead, they've been working with their landowners. They fixed every one of their leaking uh, septic tanks on their own, on a volunteer measure. They inspected them and fixed them. They've been working with agricultural uses, which I'll talk about more, forestry uses, and even impervious surfaces to try to limit the problem on a watershed approach. And with geographic information systems, that technology that we, we talked about, that mapping technology, they've been looking for those properties within the watershed that are potentially most vulnerable to erosion based on land cover, like ag or forest, based on best management practices that farmers are using, based upon slope. You know, the faster the water flows over land, the more soil it potentially picks up, and soils, among other factors. And we used a geographic information system to analyze data like this to figure out parts of the watershed that are most prone to erosion. So here is a soil loss potential analysis for sheet and rill erosion. And of course, this is looking at slope and land cover and soils. And there's a small portion in that agricultural portion of the watershed, difficult to see without a pointer. But you can see darker browns and reds in comparison to the yellow. Those are the most vulnerable to erosion based on sheet and rill. This map, a little easier to see, gully erosion. Those areas in green, least vulnerable to erosion. Those areas in yellow and red, more vulnerable to erosion. Add that up and you can see those portions of the landscape that are really of concern for the problem as at least related to agriculture. Remember that basic premise. If we don't know who owns the landscape, we have a difficult time managing it. So we took it one step further and we identified every single agricultural parcel in the watershed and we linked its potential for erosion. And then we tied it to a table to let every agricultural landowner know what the potential problems would be on their landscape. And we shared it with the local conservationists, Tim Seidel, UWSP alumni, and Ron Sphering from the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And after we supplied them with this analysis, they visited every one of those most vulnerable landscapes and the landowners and had a discussion with them. And every one of them implemented best management practices 
that keep those soils on the land where it does their crops good and out of the water where it does harm to the legacy of Lake Le Couture. And that's where I'll end tonight's presentation. So I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. I think we had a hand here first. Um, is there a large part of an Indian reservation in the area? Yeah, in fact, uh, quite a bit of this watershed. Let me go back a few slides. <clears throat> if you take a look at this watershed right between Grindstone Lake, you've got Round Lake at the top, then Grindstone Lake and Lake Le Couture. That portion between Grindstone and Lake Le Couture is largely reservation as well as that landscape <coughs> to the east. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, the Couture Lakes Association has a really good working relationship with the tribe in that case. Um, you said that uh, the floors, the land underneath the water, is owned by someone. I thought that the state would assume that, or the, the federal government. Uh, it's not still private ownership. Still private ownership. So before that land was flooded, somebody owned it. And because they flooded it doesn't mean they lost their rights to it. So whoever retained ownership after the land was flooded, they still own it today. So if the dam gets destroyed and dams periodically get taken out of the landscape for various purposes, then they would continue to own that land or whoever bought it from them after the fact. I assume that you're also interested in uh, human populations. Uh, <laughs> I, I've lived in, uh, in Wisconsin longer than any place else, but I grew up in Chicago. And um, my grandparents came from Eastern Europe. And they came to Chicago, and they came to a place where their language was spoken because they didn't speak English. Yeah. And so much of that has been determined, so much of, of, of the culture uh, of, of a place like Chicago has been determined by uh, the, 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 the necessities of immigration. Now, I assume that your, uh, uh, that your studies, also studies of uh, not, not, not just fish and trees, but of uh, human beings. Yeah, that's true. In fact, the US Bureau of the Census is the largest purveyor of geographic information on the planet. And if you think about that, I've been recently working with our archivist at UW-Stevens Point who's very interested in uh, historical census. And he's gotten a census from 1930 all the way, I think, to 1870 documented. And that information, after 70 years, is made available. It's no longer, uh, the right to privacy no longer pertains after 70 years. <laughs> and we've been documenting those historical censuses to figure out where Polish immigrants settled here in Stevens Point, where the German settled here in Stevens Point, and if uh, they settled together or if they dispersed widely across the city. And it's interesting, the patterns and trends that emerge from that data. So you're absolutely right, we can study that wily critter called a human with this technology. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, the farmers' union. There's, the farmers' union has hired a uh, watershed liaison to work with watersheds and to encourage farmers to do so, and also to um, create farmer-run watershed study groups to get them more educated and involved, which I think is kind of ties into what you say. And then I also have a question for you about Portage County, and you touched on it just now somewhat, but what makes uh, Portage County distinct? You used the word distinct earlier. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts? <laughs> well, that story is not mine to tell. Remember, I didn't tell this story. It was citizens from these areas that told their own story, and it was my job to help them tell that story. So I'm going to hold back by sharing what my opinion is of Portage County. 
<laughs> Sorry. I give up. <laughs> Was there a question over here? I think somebody had their hand up. Do you know when they replace the septic systems if they went with like plastic systems or mounds or multi-flows or how that worked? You know, someone else was part of that project. It wasn't uh, me that did the mapping, so I couldn't really tell you. I do know that uh, they thought to themselves, if we're trying to convince others in this watershed to protect this fishery, we have to begin right here. So they voluntarily inspected every septic, and then those that were leaking, they fixed them. That's, that's about as much as I could share in that regard. Sorry. Yeah. I know you mentioned for the Moose Lake project that the funds came from the uh, citizens pooling money together. In general, where does funding for projects and analyses like this come from, and what role does the state have in providing money for them? Yeah, so actually the Moose Lake money came from two sources. One was the Department of Natural Resources Lakes Grant. That provided $10,000 to do the study. Before that, there was a federal earmark uh, from the National Consortium for Geographic Information Systems. It was a multi-university consortium, and they provided another $8,000 for the previous study. For Lake Le Couture, that money was privately put together. That was another $11,000 for the agricultural study that I showed you today, and they raised another $10,000 to do a forestry study to figure out what the impact of timber harvests were on the landscape. So of course, forestry is one of the best land uses for water quality, but they're most vulnerable during timber harvests. So we tried to figure out what the factors were related there. What's interesting about the Lake Le Couture group is that they funded themselves completely. Over many decades, they've raised $750,000 to protect the fishery on Lake Le Couture, all of their own money to try to educate folks in the watershed and then also use that money to take the Department of Natural Resources to court. Yes, sir. When you had the list of uh, property owners up there, was I reading correctly that a lot of them were out of state, or at least not in the northern <coughs> part of the state? Yeah, well, that's interesting. The database does reveal those that are absentee landowners. They own land in Wisconsin, lease it to a farmer, and then live elsewhere. So that is a common phenomenon in the Northwoods. Yeah, I just noticed in Minnesota, there's well, Hayward's down the road by yeah. standards, but most of those towns are not in that county. Yeah, that's true. They lease those lands off to farmers that are local. So all they worry about is that, that could be an argument to make, right? It's not an argument to make, it is. <laughs> yeah. It's not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I bring that up because I own property in neighboring Price County. And uh, we, that would be an interesting comparison uh, as a county by county, you know, comparison. Of well, I know what you're saying. Yeah. It's widespread. Yeah. You know? Well, what was interesting is a few years ago, I did a study in Bayfield County, and we did a cognitive map. Essentially, a cognitive map is a survey that we sent folks, and we gave them a map, and we asked them questions like, where do you want to protect things, and where do you want to develop things? And they drew circles on the map where they wanted to pro land protected, and they wanted, drew circles on the map what they wanted developed. And it turned out, right next to Lake Superior in the town of Clover, Half the population wanted to develop it. Half the population wanted to protect it. And if you took a look at this list by parcel and where they lived, guess which ones wanted to develop it? The absentee landowners or the ones that live there year round? Year round, because that's how they earn their living. They wanted jobs. The folks that were absentee landowners used it for recreation. They did not want to see it developed because they wanted to see the natural scenic beauty retained. Both had a story to tell. Both were valid stories. And now what do you do with that? With the geographic information system, we finally understood the problem in a way that these people that had competing values could talk. It was a very interesting way to deal with the, the problem. All right, thank you for your time. <laughs>